She, by the name of Lucina, uh, died in the third century AD, and we have found her crypt. In her crypt is some of the earliest examples of Christian art that we have, and one of them is the picture you find on the front of your bulletin, a picture of, as you may have guessed, bread and fish. Uh, this is, the fish becomes a symbol of Christianity. Um, you might remember when John tells the story of the feeding of the 5,000, he uses the word for a very specific type of fish, an itty bitty little kind of dog chew toy type of fish. Uh, Matthew uses the word for fish, that's the generic word. It's like the difference between saying a really big carp and fish. Uh, Matthew uses the word for fish, it, and it becomes this acronym of the Greek word fish, ichthus. Uh, it becomes an acronym for Jesu Christu Theos Weos Sotar, uh, Jesus Christ, Son of God and Savior. And, and so this fish motif, that's where you eat the fish on the back of the cars, that's where this comes from, the Greek word for fish. And um, the feeding of the 5,000, one of the ways he's using fish to understand what Jesus is up to, uh, this is one of the places that begins. We turn one last time to the feeding of the 5,000. We've looked at the other three Gospels and how they tell of this event. We turn to Matthew to finish off, uh, and what we look at with Matthew, a fascinating aspect of how he tells this, is what he doesn't tell us. If you listen to what he tells us, listen and tell me what, you, uh, what is missing from this bit of the story. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over, twelve baskets, and those who ate were about five thousand. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. If you've just fed five thousand people, you think those five thousand might have something to say? Right? You just fed 5,000 people. They have no response? Well, Matthew doesn't tell us anything about their response. Right? John tells us something about their misresponse. They uh, misunderstand, try to make Jesus king uh, as the Roman kings are. But Matthew, he does not tell us anything about how the crowd responds. It is not that there isn't a reaction to what happens here. It's that you're going to have to wait for it for just a few minutes. If you remember what we've seen, especially looking at the other versions, the other uh, tellings of this story, the context matter. Mark puts the, the politics of the day right next to this and it changes how we read it. Uh, the other, for example, and the others do the same. With Matthew, he puts another event right next to uh, this so that it, you, you do get a response. We're just going to have to wait for a minute because Jesus doesn't give anyone time to respond. Jesus looks at the disciples and he immediately made the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to the other side. Now, uh, if you've ever waited tables, you know that it's not exactly a low-key job. And the idea of having waited on tables and fed 5,000 and then getting in a boat to sail it across the sea in the dark, that would be kind of intimidating, right? And so, but that's what they do. They, the 12 disciples, they get in a boat and they're sailing it across the water, even though I'm sure they'd rather be asleep on dry land. And uh, they are going across the, the water when the, the storm comes up, right? They, they are battered by the waves. Uh, the wind was against them. Literally, they are tormented by the waves and opposed by the wind. And it was kind of scary. It had to have been scary. Anyone ever been on a boat at night when a storm? This is, this is terrifying. The boat is moving beneath you and you can't see, right? The, the, the gospel tells us this is the fourth watch of the night. So it's like four in the morning. Four in the morning, uh, you can't have any light yourself because you're in a small boat. So any light you would have would have to be some sort of flame and trying to keep a flame lit while the wind is blowing and the, the waves are tormenting you, uh, that's not going to happen. And it's 4 a.m., so no one has any fires up uh, lit on the, on the banks, so you have nothing to see and navigate from that. So it's 4 a.m., the water is dark. Anyone ever jump into really pitch black water and look around? Right? It's, it's scary. I, I will never go, I, I've been in water like that once, and based on that one experience, I will never go scuba diving. Period. Never. It's, it's, this is, whew, give me the heebie-jeebies thinking about it. And, and so here they are, they're middle of the night, 4 a.m. actually. The wind is against them, the waves are tormenting them, and they see Jesus coming across the water, and it, they think it's a ghost, so they cry out in fear, as I would too. And um, Jesus says, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. 
You think you'd stop being afraid just based on that? I, I wouldn't. I would still be scared, right? Jesus is not giving them a reason to, be, to not be afraid other than the fact that it's not a ghost, which is good, but uh, it's scary, right? And, and so Peter looks at Jesus, and, and this is where Peter, he's a wingnut. He looks at Jesus and says, Lord, if it is you, command me to get out of the boat, to come to you on the water. If you were in Peter's shoes, is that what, what you would have asked? If I was in Peter's shoes, I would have started with something else like, um, hey, Jesus, why don't you get in the boat? Or maybe, um, hey, Jesus, could you calm the storm down? Or, hey, Jesus, if that's really you, could you tell me that joke you told me last night? I mean, there's so many other questions that I would ask before you'd say, hey, Jesus, tell me to get out on the water. What are you thinking, Peter? Uh, but that's what Peter says. He says this, and Jesus says, come. So Peter gets out of the boat, starts walking on the water, and... Um, Peter is getting better at this whole following Jesus thing, showing that he understands with faith. Faith is uh, your ability to do something even when you are afraid, right? The, the ability to do something even when you are afraid, to do it through the fear, uh, not expecting fear to go away. There would have been fear, though. And just to, let's just take a moment to, to sort of fully experience this. We have this, like when I was first reading this passage, I had this mental image of like Peter talking to Jesus and, and maybe a couple feet away and uh, just kind of a calm tone of voice. Hey, Jesus, that's you who asked me to get on the water. Why, yes, it is me, Jesus. Come on out in the water. Okay, Jesus, here I come. I think it's kind of a calm conversation. That's not actually what was happening because remember the wind is blowing. Oh, So the wind is blowing and you're trying to have a conversation over the wind. Except it's probably not just the wind, what else is it? Probably the rain. You ever have to try to have a conversation with a screaming kid? That's kind of what I thought of as I was thinking of this. So if Jesus is coming up to the boat. Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's me. And Peter says, if it's you, come. Is that what you were thinking when I was reading that out of the gospel? <laughs> you read it about the second time and you think that, whew, there's got to be more going on there. And that, that's, that's right. Yeah, Jesus reaches out, brings him into the boat, and they get in the boat, and that is when the wind ceased. And this is the moment that Peter, or that Matthew has been driving to. You go back to the feeding of the 5,000, we have no response. They get in the boat, we don't know what the disciples think. We get into, Jesus walks on water, they get in the boat, and here's the moment that, Ma that Matthew has been driving to. They look at Jesus and say, truly you are the Son of God. This is the response that Matthew's been waiting for. First, the disciples experienced the feeding of the 5,000. Now they see Jesus walking on water, and this is when they get it right. They get it right because they've had both this miracle of bread and this miracle of water. And if you have a sense that you've read something about this before, you have. If you think back to Moses, what's Moses do? He walks through water, and he calls down bread from heaven, manna. Jesus one-ups them. He creates bread, and he walks on water. And so it, the disciples are looking at him, and this is a, a, a prophet like Moses, but even more so. Here is someone greater than Moses, and the disciples get it right when they say, this is the Son of God. They get it right. To see Jesus properly, to understand him, you have to both see the kingdom and the king. The feeding of the 5,000 shows us something important about the kingdom, that in the kingdom of God there is abundance, there is plenty. With 5,000 there is still enough to eat. There's always room for one more at the table. But you also have to see the king, right? The king who beckons those who are citizens of the kingdom to get out of the boat, take a risk, and go walk on water. It is my fervent hope that every person here has done as the disciples did in that boat and having seen glimpses of the kingdom to come. 
And having seen something of who the king is, can then say, Son of God, my Savior. It is essential to be able to do both. To be able to see kingdom and, and king. And I know as we sit here today that there are many people who are here who are out and serving on a regular basis. And I know there are people here who have taken risks and stepped out of the boat to follow Jesus because he has beckoned him. I hope that this church is facilitating each of you to be able to do this. I hope we are, and I, uh, my hope has been reinforced this week as... Um, I see greater and greater need for the good news of the gospel today. This is not where I expected this sermon to go. This sermon got away from me because I, I did something. I, I read an article on uh, CBS.com. When's the last time you saw something on CBS News and thought, that's rocked your world? I mean, it's kind of vanilla, right? It's not exactly the most exciting news source out there. This, I didn't see this coming. I read a CBS report about uh, the number of people living on, on under $2 a day. And it's doubled in this country since 1996. Right, doubled. 1.5 million households, 3 million children are now living on under $2 a day. Uh, some math on that, there are 74 million children in the nation. That means one in 20, 5%. Right, think of how big our school is. One in five, or one in twenty, or five percent of kids are being raised on under two dollars a day. What's that co cover? Like one and a half diapers? <laughs> it just—it's not enough. Uh, and the number of people. 1996 is the important year for that because that's the year when welfare ceased to exist and uh, TANF was was introduced. And the number of people on where welfare in '96 was 14 million. And the number of people on TANF is 3.8. So the number of people who are getting any sort of assistance has dropped dramatically. Uh, and, and I was reading this, and, and I had the, the, the sermon about the feeding of the 5,000 kicking around, and I didn't know where it was going to land. I really thought I was about to talk about Moses at great length, Moses and Jesus. And, and I read this, and, and I couldn't help but think of... Um, the first, the first question in Scripture. The first question a person asks in Scripture. Not the first question God asks. Not the first question the snake asks. The first question a person asks is in Genesis 4 when Cain asks, Am I my brother's keeper? And God doesn't answer because it says God was horrified. And you can see much of the rest of the Bible as God's response to that. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, Jesus just fed 5,000. The answer is yes. Yes, we are our brother's keepers. And so I, I read this thing on CBS, and it got me thinking, feeding the 5,000, and there's so many who are hungry and, and needy and broken, and then I see the way in which church is sort of shoved aside as one club among many, one more thing that you can go to if you want to, instead of being the, the most important hour of the week in which we proclaim Christ crucified and respond by offering ourselves to the work of his kingdom. I truly believe this is the most important hour of the week, for it orders every other part of, of the week. And, and so we see the disciples, and, and they've seen bread and they've seen water. They've seen the feeding of the 5,000, uh, the, the something that shows them about the kingdom of God. And they've seen Jesus walk on water, and they know him to be king. And now, based on this new understanding, they make this, this confession, Jesus, you are the Son of God. And it's not that... They didn't know that already. Like, they've already committed to follow Jesus. The fact that they're in the boat is because they committed to follow Jesus. This is a new level of commitment they reach based upon a new level of experience of, of, of who Jesus is. And so that leads me to the ending. I did not expect this to happen. All right, this is not the ending I expected to have on this sermon. Jesus got squirrely on me. He does that on occasion. And uh, yet here I am at the end, and I have to say, I think we're building to something of an altar call. All right? Isn't that fun? Didn't see that coming, did you? I didn't either. But we're going to come forward in a minute to, uh, to take communion, where we break bread and we receive God's abundance. And then I'm going to ask you to either kneel here at the altar, or if you need to, go back to your uh, pew, if that, that's your knees would like that better. And I'm going to invite you to uh, answer these two questions for yourself. Out of the abundance that I've been given, who does Jesus call me to go and feed? And might I have to take a risk and step out of the boat to do so? Out of the abundance that I have been given, 
that God has given me, who do I need to get out and go serve? And might I have to take a risk to step out of the boat to do so? Amen.